everyone, and welcome to the Nebraska Easement Action Team and Bold Nebraska webinar on carbon pipelines and knowing you the rights that you have to either fight these pipelines or to get better and stronger terms in a contract that you would have with either the Navigator Carbon Pipeline or the Summit Carbon Pipeline. There's also a third carbon pipeline that could be threatening the state of Nebraska. It's called tall grass, which would be converting a fracked gas pipeline to a carbon pipeline. In today's webinar, we're gonna be going through all of the risks and the regulatory structure around carbon pipelines. A pipeline expert, Paul Blackburn, is going to do that section. Then we're gonna turn it over to Brian Jordy. He's with the Domino Law Group. And he's the lawyer that's been retained by the Nebraska Easement Action Team, as well as other easement action teams in Iowa and in South Dakota that are all working with one primary mission, and that is to protect landowners' property rights against the use of eminent domain for private gain and to ensure that property rights are the first and foremost uh, factor in whether a pipeline agreement gets signed. We know that you have lots of questions, things like, what do we do if a land survey uh, comes to my door and wants to get in and I don't want to give them permission? Do I have a right to not give them permission? Uh, we know that you have questions on, is this pipeline easement forever? Can I build on top of the pipeline easement? There are so many questions that we know that you all have that tonight we hope to get you the answers for. First, I just want to give a brief mention of the Nebraska Easement Action Team website. Uh, Mark, who's our communications director, is going to put up that site. We will also make sure that you have that link in the Q&A section. The website is now live where you can, at the end of this seminar, if you're interested in joining all the landowners who are coming together to protect their rights as a group because you're stronger together as a group, you'll be able to click on the website fill out the form, and then the legal team gets in touch with you to talk about all the next steps. One of the things that I just wanted to say, I head up a group called Bold Nebraska. We worked with over 12 years with farmers, ranchers, tribal nations, as well as the legal team of the Domino Law Group in order to stop the Keystone XL pipeline from using eminent domain and from threatening the sand hills in the Ogallala Aquifer with a very risky tar sands pipeline. We fought that pipeline for lots of reasons, the threats to our water, the threats to climate, but the first and foremost reason we were against the Keystone XL pipeline was that they wanted to use eminent domain for their private gain. Carbon pipelines right now are an untested, unregulated uh, pipeline process in our country. There's only 5,000 miles of carbon pipelines in the United States, and the carbon pipeline companies wanna ramp that up to over 60,000 miles in a very short term, probably in about three to five years. We believe our country is not ready for these carbon pipelines. They, they don't do anything to help solve the climate crisis. All they do is line the pockets of big uh, oil and fracked gas and carbon pipeline corporations. So with that, I'm gonna turn the mic over to Paul Blackburn, who's gonna go over the state and federal regulatory structures, um, as well as talk about some kind of specifics on the risks of these pipelines. Real quick, sorry, Jane. Uh, hey, everyone, I'm Mark Heffner. Uh, I'm the communications director for Bold. Um, if you have a question, anytime you can click the Q&A button if you're on Zoom and type it and we'll get to it during the call. If you are on the phone, you can text a question to 402-302-2611 at any time and we'll get to your uh, question during the Q&A. Thanks a lot. Take it up, take it away, Paul. Hey Mark, am I up now? Can people see me? Okay, because uh, I can only see you still. All right, We're good. Uh, hi everybody. My name is Paul Blackburn and I'm an attorney. Um, I've worked on Pipeline Matters since, uh, my, uh, since 2008. And uh, Jane asked me to learn as much as I could about these pipelines from a regulatory, commercial and safety point of view and help you understand some of this. I started my career in Washington, DC, working on for the industry on, on oil on project development and energy project development efforts. 
And um, so I have a fairly strong background in, in energy law and energy policy and energy technology. Um, so I'll be helping um, to raise some issues and to explain some of what's happening with these pipelines. Let me move into my presentation here. Does that look good, Mark? Looks great, Paul. Okay. Um, so let's move right into it. So what is supercritical carbon dioxide? Well, it's uh, an unusual substance. I mean, it's carbon dioxide is very common, but supercritical carbon dioxide is carbon dioxide has been impressed um, to the point where it has a, a hybrid characteristic of both characteristics of both a liquid and a gas. And this is important because it can move, even though it's a sort of a liquid, it's a fluid, it can still move through porous solids like a gas but it can dissolve some liquids and solids such as oils and plastics. That's one of the reasons it's used to enhance oil recovery. Um, small changes in pressure, temperature, or contamination may result in dramatic changes in how it behaves, and it's almost as heavy as water. Okay. Does my next slide come up? Uh, not yet, no. There we go. Okay. Um, so the reason it's used as shipped as a supercritical fluid is that much greater amounts can be shipped as a fluid than as a gas. And it needs to be in a supercritical state, as I said, for sequestration and for enhanced oil recovery. So they're not gonna ship it as a gas because it wouldn't be economic. And it's necessary, technically speaking, for both sequestration and, and enhanced oil recovery. Um, and the question is, is the, is the, are the CO2 pipelines the same as, as oil and gas pipelines? And they're really not. And that's because of this hybrid gas liquid nature, supercritical CO2 behaves very differently from um, during operations and ruptures. And it's a, these unusual, properties cause safety issues. Almost all current CO2 pipeline safety research is being done overseas and unfortunately not that much is happening in the United States. Um, trace amounts of water in the CO2 and CO2 can cause rapid corrosion, everybody knows that uh, in the industry, and, but also contaminants mixed in with the uh, CO2 and water can cause and accelerate corrosion as well. It's much more corrosive than most crude oils are. Um, and, because, and also because it it, of its nature, it can dissolve certain kinds of materials such as seals, coatings, and lubricants and other non-metallic materials because uh, it will dissolve hydrocarbons. Um, and because it's also a hybrid between a, a, a gas and a liquid, it, it behaves very different in terms of the way it's, it, it can, it, it, way, in terms of pressure. Um, and if it switches, um, form from a liquid to a gas, it can really be dramatic pressure changes very quickly. And this can damage pipelines. And one of the most dramatic kinds of damage is what's called a running ductal fracture. And that's where a rupture happens in a CO2 pipeline. And then as the gas, as a supercritical CO2 converts to a gas, the gas wants to take up a lot more space and it'll create a pressure spike. And that pressure spike can be so great, it can, it can essentially rip a pipeline open and uh, the way people describe it is unzipping a pipeline. And you know, another, another thing that's different with this is that small amounts of, uh, and changes in the amounts of types of contaminants in a CO2 stream really may have very dramatic impacts on safety and operations. And changes in the shipment amounts uh, created, can create additional changes. For example, if the ethanol industry goes through seasonal variations or market cycles, the amount of, of supercritical CO2 that can be transported in any given period can change dramatically. And those changes in volume can have significant impacts on operations as well. Um, in addition, uh, when supercritical CO2 is depressurized, it can convert to dry ice. And dry ice forms 109 degrees uh, Fahrenheit, minus 109 degrees Fahrenheit. And this rapid, this formation of dry ice can, um, can clog up pipes and valves and, and, and inhibit the operation of other equipment. So, so that's not something that's common in, in gas or it doesn't happen in gas and oil pipelines. In addition, this supercooling can cause what are called brittle fracture and pipeline components. 
and it can also possibly in turn uh, possibly um, chain damage internal and external pipeline coatings. Um, and the risk to humans and animals is that it can asphyxiate people and it can also intoxicate them. Um, some of the symptoms of um, CO2 poisoning are headaches, loss of smell, dizziness, nausea, vomiting, all these things here, including um, loss of consciousness, confusion, uh, regulators, coma, and death. And the, one of the most important things you need to figure out is what the danger zone is when there's a rupture. Um, and that's going to depend based on uh, weather conditions, the size of the pipeline, and different topographies. The most significant uh, CO2 pipeline, pipeline rupture in the U.S. to date was the rupture in Satarsha, Mississippi, just a little bit over a year ago, in fact, uh, two years ago, two days ago. And it was a 24-inch pipeline that ruptured and released 9.5 miles of, of CO2 in that pipeline, or a total of 9,532 barrels. 49 people were hospitalized and over 250 evacuated. Fortunately, nobody died, but it was a close call. Um, and what are the symptoms of different exposure levels? Well, when you get about 4% in the atmosphere, um, then it's immediately dangerous to life or health. Uh, about 5%, and that's when you get into uh, respiratory problems, dizziness, confusion, headache, and shortness of breath. And there's also dimmed sight, and above that, you get into serious kinds of conditions, including unconsciousness and death. Now, in Satarsha, people were passing out. The, the emergency responders described folks as walking around like zombies and drooling. Um, they were, you know, so therefore they probably had um, concentration levels above 5% because of that rupture. Um, so, as I mentioned, running ductal fractures happen when the pipeline is over, it ruptures and, it can, and the gas convert, the, the liquid converts to gas. And this can be stopped using stronger steel or crack arresters, but the engineering models are really not adequate for this yet. Um, here's a picture of a running ductal fracture that was triggered by a test um, in Italy. You can see in the background um, here, I'm just going to get up here, this is Tarsha. Um, you can see in the background here that there's some people um, in front of that white building in the back on the right hand side, you give you a sense of scope. The, um, the pipeline was 24 inches in diameter. You can see that this rupture tore that pipeline uh, to pieces and blew a trench um, into the ground about 50 meters long. And then they stopped that from extending any further by crack arresters. Here's a picture of one of the crack arresters on the left-hand side that was, that was a part of that test. And, and essentially it's wrapped with a composite and it tore um, part of that composite arrestor away. They didn't have that there, that rupture could have continued for, an, for a longer period of time, longer distance. Um, with regard to the modeling for how far the CO2 would go on a rupture, this is something that citizens really need to know. They really need to know, and first responders, what the danger zone is, because CO2 is generally not, can't, it, it may not be able to smell it or see it. So unless there's some kind of ability to predict where, how far the danger zone will be, it won't really be possible for first responders to know how far to set up barriers and barricades to keep people away from it, or for citizens to know how far they have to go to get out of the danger zone. Um, and again, these danger zones can be predicted by a number of computer models, uh, take, some of which take into account weather and topography. Um, and regulators in industry have, as far as I can tell, have not defined what the danger zones are for CO2 pipelines. We know what they are for natural gas pipelines, for example, but not for CO2 pipelines. Um, the federal permits and regulation. Right now, federal law regulates the safety of pipe, those CO2 pipelines, but only with regard to their design, construction, operation, and maintenance. The federal law does not regulate the route of, of a CO2 pipeline. Um, 49 USC 60104E states, this chapter does not authorize the Secretary of Transportation to prescribe the location or routing of a pipeline facility. Um, so the federal government has no ability to decide where a pipeline goes, nor does it have any ability to consider safety in, a, in pipeline routing because it can't consider routing in the first place. So if a state doesn't consider the safety of, a, of the route of a CO2 pipeline, like whether it goes to uh, nursing, goes by nursing homes or hospitals or um, you know, schools, if the state doesn't consider that, then, then the, federal government, the federal government can't, so the state must. 
Um, in addition, there are Army Corps of Engineers regulations that regulate water crossings. Um, in Nebraska, since federal law does not prohibit, um, does not preempt Nebraska from determining route, um, it can also consider safety in the routing and also consider safety for emergency response. I think everybody would agree that emergency responders should be able to know information about the safety of a pipeline in its danger zone so they know how to respond appropriately. Um, and also the federal government doesn't regulate mitigation following construction or abandonment. And uh, right now in Nebraska, mitigation following construction is, is, um, is regulated by the state for crude oil pipelines, but not for CO2 pipelines. And uh, not, the state doesn't regulate what happens after the pipeline is abandoned at all. And since federal law only applies to operating pipelines, it doesn't apply to pipelines that have been abandoned. Um, you know, it's up to the state to decide what happens with the pipeline after it's abandoned. Um, so, but since Nebraska has currently has no state laws that apply to CO2 pipelines in terms of regulating the route or mitigating them, uh, the Nebraska County should have the power to enact ordinances um, for route permits and setbacks. Um, and also Nebraska may grant the right to eminent domain, but we'll see about that. Um, federal 45Q tax credit. So why is this big rush to build? Well, the federal 45Q tax credit is so generous that it's created a gold rush. Um, essentially, the federal government is creating such generous subsidies that all the companies are piling in to try to build CO2 pipelines. Just because Congress thinks that it's a great idea to subsidize these uh, projects doesn't mean they're, that it's that they're ready for it or that it really is going to help climate change, which it won't. Um, in addition, um, the, the taxes, the federal tax credit that's allowed this, that's um, creating the money for these pipelines um, is, uh, is given to the entity that captures and sequesters CO2. And that can be a variety. It could be the pipeline company. It could be the, the place where the, where the CO2 comes, like, comes from, including ethanol plants. Um, in 2026, the tax credit will be $50 per metric ton, and it will last for 12 years from the date the project comes online. And in Nebraska, those the, the Nebraska um, parts of uh, Summit Navigator alone would, would be worth up to 30 million per year for Summit, up to 50 million per year for Navigator. So there's a lot of money that would come on from these CO2 pipelines. Um, one of the things that's really different about these pipelines is that uh, the scale is entirely different from anything that's been done. As, as Jane said, there's only 5,000 miles of CO2 pipelines in. Um, the US and they want to jump it up to tens of thousands of miles, you know, 60, 70,000 miles, maybe even more. And, uh, you know, but the, their experience so far is with relatively simple systems with CO2 pipelines that go, you know, from a single CO2 source to oil fields uh, to an oil field for enhanced oil recovery. You know, the Summit Navigator projects are much larger scale and involve many sources and likely many sequestration wells. And this larger scale will cause a variety of technical challenges, create new safety risks and require new statutes and regulations. You know, they're, they're jumping from something small to something massive. And here's a, a map of the pipelines of this, just these two pipelines. But this may be just the first wave. They're, these pipelines are only uh, connecting to some of the ethanol facilities in Iowa, Nebraska, Minnesota, and South Dakota and Illinois. Um, there's ethanol facilities all over the Midwest, and there's also other kinds of facilities that generate CO2, including power plants, uh, fertilizer plants, and cement plants. And if you overlay all these different kinds of CO2 sources um, on, if you overlay all these CO2 sources on um, the uh, uh, on a map like this, we could end up with a huge mess of spaghetti with pipelines running everywhere from different uh, emitters to different sequestration sites. And without any planning, without any coordination, without any regulation um, that determines the corridors of, for all these pipelines together, this could become a real big mess. And you know, so that we shouldn't just simply accept that these pipelines are going to happen. We really need to, to take a step back and, um, and make sure that we understand what the risks are. And with that, I believe I'm done and thank you for listening. 
Thank you, Paul. I always appreciate all your really deep knowledge on these issues. And you'll be able to ask Paul some questions uh, at the end. We're going to turn it now to Brian Jordy. He is the lead attorney with the Domino Law Group that's helping landowners in Iowa, Nebraska, South Dakota, uh, and potentially North Dakota, Minnesota, Illinois as well, where landowners are also battling these carbon pipelines. And that may seem overwhelming, um, but I promise you, uh, whenever you take on a pipeline fight, it does seem overwhelming at first. And then you start to learn more and more, and you start to realize there's lots of people just like you uh, that want to protect your property rights. So with that, I'll turn it over to Brian. Great. Thanks, Jane, and Paul and Mark. Appreciate the opportunity to be here. I'm going to run through some slides, folks, as well to illustrate um, the importance of what we're, we're doing and the services that we're offering. So I am a lawyer with Domino Law. I've been working directly for large groups of landowners in Nebraska and other states for about the last 12 years, specifically related to uh, pipeline and eminent domain abuse and constitutional property rights, and have been involved in lots of other uh, landowner fights over giant corporations wanting to take their land or destroy their way of, of living. Um, and so it's been my pleasure to represent hundreds of folks in Nebraska and around the country in these, in these fights. So this slide here shows an actual exhibit from a hearing also similar to a trial that we had here in Nebraska back in 2017. And the reason I show this is because just like back in 2010, when our fight against the Keystone XL pipeline in Nebraska got underway, people would have meetings like this, although we were you know, in person at that time, some phone conferences, and they didn't know what was going on. They weren't sure who to turn to. They didn't know the resources that were available or that there was a, a mechanism, a team, a network in place to help be their mouthpiece, help defend them, protect them. And those people went from folks just like you, dialing in, trying, kind of kicking the tires, learning information, all the way to becoming members of the NEAT organization, to advocating against eminent domain abuse, uh, becoming our clients directly with the law firm, and participating in direct legal action to stand up for their rights. Because if you don't exercise your rights, they're like a muscle, they'll atrophy. And this is not something that you want to be dealing with, but now it's on your doorstep. And you can either look the other way and just hope someone else figures it out or give up, or you can stand up and join together with others that are just like you and become like our folks here, ultimately uh, clients uh, and people that help protect the rights of everyone else in Nebraska. Uh, during the Trans-Canada fight, we went through two different rounds of condemnation, beat them back once. Uh, in 2015, beat them back again in 2019. And after approximately 11 year battle, uh, they finally abandoned the project once and for all last year. So Nebraska Easement Action Team, what is it? Well, it's not something that we just came up with last night. It was created in 2012. It's been around now almost uh, at its 10 year birthday coming up in a couple months. Um, it's a it's organized and has 501c3 status, which means you can make donations payments that are tax deductible. Um, so it's not a directly an, an anti pipeline group. What it is, it's an educational landowner empowerment group and wants to help teach you the best practices of how to deal with these companies, how to exercise your rights, and then if you want to take the next step of joining the active legal challenges and legal representation that the NEAT model provides, then you can become clients of ours, Domino Law, via the NEAT organization, where we will help uh, take direct legal action to defend you. And the concept's pretty simple. Any one of us sitting in our homes here on our own are frankly not likely to have much success. Two of us is better than one, 10 is better than two, 100 is better than 10, and so on and so on. And so when we offer this model across an entire state, and then actually across all of the states that are being affected by this, we really 
have a powerful information sharing vehicle uh, so that the summit navigator, their land agents aren't getting away with sneaky things in different areas because we're talking across the states. We're pooling and sharing that information. We're helping you with the appropriate responses and giving you a path forward to best help protect your land and rights. Um, and we have a real strong focus on the, the easement, the contract that actually will determine your rights and their rights if the project goes forward. So it's really a two-prong approach. First, what direct legal action can we take to protect your land completely? At the end of the day, you are most safe and with the least amount of annoyance and frustration if they don't take your property for their projects. So that's first and foremost. If that doesn't succeed, then we have to fall back to defending and protecting and getting the very best deal and the fine print that's where the rubber hits the road on these contracts so that you're not in a world of hurts should something bad happen uh, in the future. And that's what we talk about focusing on better easement terms. Paul showed you this map and it's true. It, it's already starting to be a spaghetti just with these two projects. But what you don't see here is that this projects and this is summit goes across multiple states. And the interesting part about these pipelines is that the terminus or the endpoint is up here in North Dakota where this large green area is depicted. And the idea is to, to allegedly capture CO2, send it across your land, under, through, around your fields, your homes, and thousands of other people, and then just dump it in the ground in North Dakota and hope everything works out okay. And so if they need to get to North Dakota, you can see why learning and knowing what's going around in Southern North Dakota, all through South Dakota, into parts of Iowa, and of course here in Nebraska, which is some of the most Southern portions of the proposed route, is important. Because if there's victories and um, headway going in North Dakota, South Dakota, parts of Iowa, that also benefits you, which is why it's really great that we're all connected and have a giant regional team working on this for any of those who want to join with your fellow landowners and get on board. So what do they want? Well, they wanna control a portion of your land, your property forever to do what they want and to prevent you from doing certain things that you would ordinarily be able to do in the ordinary course because their infrastructure, their pipeline is gonna be in the way. So they want it their way and they want profits and they want profits at your expense and they want to limit their risk. That's one way they guarantee profits by minimizing the potential impact of spills or other risks or potential future damages by offering to pay you as little as humanly possible and hiding behind the eminent domain, which really is typically reserved just for governments and not private companies to make billionaires more billions. They won't pay any taxes in terms of property taxes on your land. So you still pay all the taxes, even though you've got this project, this pipeline running underneath your ground every day, making them millions of dollars second by second. And they have the power to sell or transfer that easement and all of these rights and to prevent you from doing certain things to anybody they want at any time. And you don't get any veto power, don't get paid for the troubles. And after all, this is all happening on your land, what you've worked hard for um, and what you likely support your family with. So how to protect yourself? Well, the first step is you're here. You're eager enough and open enough to learn and that's great. And so a brief background, how can they even do this? Well, the Fifth Amendment of the US Constitution includes what's called the takings clause. So literally how can the government, if ever, take the land of a private citizen? Well, it can be done if the threshold is met of the concept public use. If they're gonna take a portion of your land to expand a road or something that everyone can feasibly or arguably use, or to build a community hospital, for instance, that we can all benefit from at some point and use, then they have the government that is the right to take all or a portion of your land if they pay you justly or fairly. Now that concept has come down and been watered down over the years from public use to public benefit 
economic benefits, uh, public interest, et cetera. Our constitution is very similar, it virtually mirrors the federal constitution. And so we still in Nebraska have the concepts and the hurdles that the projects need to be for public use, which we think is gonna be very difficult with this, these particular projects. So you obviously have the rights of the surface to occupy the land, you, have, you can grow crop, you can improve it, buildings, uh, put sheds, grain bins, you have rights to the subterranean materials, minerals, et cetera, air rights, and you have the right not only to do the things you want on your land, but to also prevent others from coming onto your land and doing things to you that you don't want. And these rights are the important rights that we're talking about and that NEAT wants to help you defend. So you've all heard this likely and maybe been told it yourself from the friendly land agents who come by to try to quick get you to sign something that you don't understand, doesn't make a lot of sense, isn't necessary to be signed and for a project you didn't want. And they will tell you, don't worry, the pipeline company will pay for everything. It's our pipeline after all, it's our CO2. So don't worry about if there's a rupture, spill, leak or any other damages. And that sounds really good. The only problem is it's not true. And I know it's not true based on what the law says, but also on unfortunate practical experience with clients right here in Nebraska, in Auburn, Nebraska, where the pipeline as shown there was long, long since forgotten, 50, 60 years since it was constructed, all the nice signs that warned about it were not maintained as a pipeline company was just counting their money day after day, year after year. And the son of the then owner was removing a hedgerow with a bulldozer as he lawfully could on land they owned. And what do you know, hit a pipeline and 6,000 barrels of fuel started spewing onto their ground about a quarter million gallons. Now, if the spill is occurring on a pipeline, that means that pipeline has to shut down. That means they're not making money and that means they're not very happy. And so this is taken right out of a newspaper article that you could Google from um, Auburn, Nebraska. And at the end of it, it says that the pipeline spokesperson was interviewed and wanted to know, well, gosh, you know, what's we're worried about the landowner, what's going to happen to them? I mean, they didn't mean to do this. It was a mistake, honest mistake. And that spokesperson said they didn't know if the landowner or his son would uh, face any penalties. Well, their lawyers sure knew what they wanted to do, and they sued them for approximately $5 million in federal court right here in Nebraska. So that's the pipeline company taking care of you in case of any spill. Now, beyond the catastrophic incidents of the spills, which arguably will be rare, although they do occur, and if it happens to you, it doesn't matter if it hasn't happened to anybody else. And that's why these are so risky. But beyond that, just the basic destruction of your land and the trenching to prepare and to get ready to lay the pipeline. This is a contractor for Keystone XL down in Texas that's literally in the front yard of one of my clients and they took this picture right out of their front yard about 15 feet from their kitchen window. And the reason I show this is because to get a flavor of the real sense of all the other problems and issues. So there's a pipeline company, they're laying the route and this landowner would in investigate and inspect, you know, day by day. And they even started to be friends with the people and bringing them lunch and everything seemed fine until the contractor caused damages because they were so close to the home. And at first, well, it didn't seem like much. Why don't we just put some great stuff in there and we'll try to, you know, deal with the foundation cracking and it'll probably be fine. Well, then they severed a sewer line and then the homeowner um, home backed up with the sewer, water, gases, black mold was created, and I had to negotiate a way for them to get out of this. And the result was their entire home had to be torn down, destroyed, and they had to rebuild a new home. Now, thankfully, we got that resolved, but not after a lot of headaches. So it's not just a catastrophic spill. There's countless things you want to prepare yourself against. It also has problems when it comes to who's going to pay for crop damage, right? If you're a farmer or there's disruption in your ranching operation, who's going to pay for the economic loss? Well, again, 
If it's not in writing, it doesn't matter. And they'll tell you like they did this person that they were gonna pay out at $8 a bushel for corn. And that all sounded fine when they said it, but when the damage was there and this landowner tried to collect against this particular uh, pipeline, Enbridge, which is the largest in the world, TransCanada is the second largest pipeline company, they were nowhere to be found, ran them around and around and around, and they ultimately got pennies on the dollar just because they were frustrated. So what are we going to do about this? You know, what is the easement in the Nebraska easement team? Well, it's a strip of land that you are unwilling to sell. You don't want to sell. You don't have a for sale sign out there. But if they take it by using eminent domain against you, then they can do essentially whatever they want within the easement, however they type it up, describe it, what they throw in there and all the little goodies that allows them to do what they want at your expense on, under, across, and through your property. You still own it, you pay the taxes, you have liability like we discussed, um, and they still get to use it permanently and forever, and they only pay you one time. So that's what you're looking forward to, you know, unless we can get together and do something about it. So the fine print, most people get bogged down on the price, and it's a classic tactic. They show you the numbers and wow, look at this. And if you sign right away, maybe there's even a signing bonus. My goodness, how exciting is that? But they don't talk about all of the things we just discussed. We don't even know who Summit Carbon Solutions is. Who owns it? How many assets do they have? If there's a catastrophic problem, do they have the money? In Iowa, all they have to do is put up a $250,000 bond or, or a surety proving that they have $250,000. What do you think that's going to do? if there's any damage whatsoever that would cause a rupture, a leak, or a spill. Um, they can abandon it in place, and, and then you just have a rotting, essentially rotting fuel tanks underneath your ground, and good luck paying for that if you want to get rid of them in the future. Uh, and, and they can convert the pipeline potentially in the future, like one in Nebraska now, Tallgrass, is trying to do, and they don't necessarily have to pay you any more money. Um, and the idea of the one-time payment and not periodic payments like wind or solar or other clean green energy projects is really something that doesn't sit well with me and most landowners. So why NEAT? Well, one of the main benefits is if you sign up with NEAT and engage in the legal representation with us, we deal with all the communications with the pipeline company. So right out of the gate, if you're sick of their phone calls, emails, letters, knocks on your door, you tell them, hey, I'm with NEAT, I'm represented by Domino Law, deal with them. And then you can go on about your day and if you wanna have periodic updates or frequent updates or no updates, that's up to you. We then compile information from all landowners in Nebraska and across the country affected by this to make sure no one is getting that information. And we communicate the latest tips, strategies, best practices. If and when direct legal action is necessary to protect you, We'll get in there and we'll lead the charge and we'll walk you through that process. And then if we get to the point where a negotiation has to occur, we will protect you the very best we can by negotiating all of the fine print terms other than the price, which is obviously very variable between person to person, to get a master template easement that has been vetted by people working for you and not just the pipeline company. So, how do you get involved? Well, go to the website, nebraskaeasement.org. There's a one-page form that you can find on the website. You can type it right in there, or you can print it off and handwrite it in. There's $100 to, to join. Why is there $100 to join? Because for doing this over the last decade plus, there are moles, believe it or not, people that are in bed with the pipeline companies and want to come into our meetings and want to take information and, and spread all sorts of misinformation. So although far from foolproof, putting a little skin in the game up front to get in usually weeds out those kind of people so we can focus on the people that are serious. And then if you want to be a part of what the legal representation is and the direct legal action, the economic model is pretty simple. We work on an hourly basis. And that rate is $350 an hour. And you might say, oh my goodness gracious, I could never afford that. But you can, because here's what we do. We don't charge every single person that. We charge that for the entire effort. And so if there's 10 people, you've now hired 
the entire NEAT team and the legal representation for $35 an hour. If there's a hundred of you, like there are in Iowa over a hundred landowners, now you're at 350 an hour. And so the only question is two questions. Is my land and property and my legacy and my family worth enough to stand up and fight this? If that's yes, and then you know you can't fight it for free, are you willing to pay pennies on the dollar in a sense or a mere fraction of a, what it would cost and all the extra benefit? If that makes sense to you, then need is something that you should be a part of. And if we get down to the easement negotiations after all of that has not gone uh, the way we had hoped, that's also prorated. So we're sharing costs, we're sharing fees across everyone, a small fraction for each of you. And we cap that at not to exceed $2,750 on the easement negotiation piece. And that's simply because then people can budget. There's an absolute worst case that I don't believe we will hit because I'm confident we'll have so many people to spread the cost out that we won't even get to that number, which is far less than you'd pay a lawyer if you were just doing that negotiation part on your own. So I've kind of hit you with a fire hose of information there, and I want to turn it back uh, to Jane, and I'll be um, ready uh, whenever you have any questions to um, help you understand need further. Perfect. Thank you, Brian. And again, thank you, Paul. Um, you can type a question into the Q&A box. So far, there's only been like logistical questions about the recording or where the easement contract is. Um, so if you're on the webinar right now, you can go on the bottom of your screen. You should see a Q&A little bubble and you can, I don't know why my screen just froze, but you can click on the Q&A uh, and type in a question so we can give folks a second to do that. While we're waiting, I'll just jump in and, you know, one of the questions people might be shy to ask is, well, isn't it hopeless? I mean, what can we really do against these giant corporations? Well, you can do a lot, right? You can actually stop these if that's your goal. Uh, you can, if you want to go the route of negotiating, at least get a fair deal where you have some protections. Um, so a whole host of things can be done. This is far from hopeless. And the team here, when we've all been together on different projects, we're so far 100% success rate. Now, uh, just like in investing, uh, the future return or, or past gains are not necessarily indicative of future returns, but uh, we've got a great method, a great system, a great team, and, and we're confident we can improve your situation. I know a couple questions that always do get asked, and so, if folks are um, thinking of questions to ask in the Q&A. Um, one of the questions is, what is the process in Nebraska? Because I'm sure if you're a landowner, you're reading a lot of the uh, news articles about Iowa because there's several pipelines in Iowa and over potentially 800 to 1,000 impacted landowners in Iowa. And they've been dealing with it for longer than in Nebraska, where the pipeline company just started doing public meetings. Um, so why is Iowa so busy and not Nebraska? Brian, do you want to answer that? And I'm sure Paul and I cannot do it. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think one, one of the main reasons Iowa is so busy is, you know, where they're geographically located, but also in the case of Summit, that's where the main owner and backer um, Bruce Restetter of Iowa, he lives in Iowa, he has all the Iowa connections, has been greasing the political wheels with cash for years. And I think the thought there was, A, they can probably slam it through, and there's a very defined process. There you go to the Iowa Utility Board, and there's a structured process, and three board members end up voting either, we will give you the route, and then there's an eminent domain trigger, and, and so it should be, they think, a faster, easier, smoother process. Whereas in Nebraska, Nebraska is the Wild West out of all the states involved, which can be good and can be bad. It, it means our legislatures haven't been thoughtful enough to put laws in place to protect you, but it also could be an advantage because there is no clear path. There's lots of options for legal challenges and frankly, uh, delay, which is oftentimes the least 
uh, wealthy of the people in the fight, which is always the landowner's best tool. Uh, because again, that increased the cost for the pipeline companies and then makes them more likely to deal with you if they realize um, that the project can go on and on. And so because there's no path in Nebraska, there is no PSC, IUB, P, UC process, it, it really is going to be a showdown in the courts and, and some judges and probably the Supreme Court will have to tell us uh, whether or not they do have eminent domain rights or if a new law has to get passed. So that's my two cents, Jane. Yeah, that's right. And we're prepared to take uh, court action if necessary and obviously have been encouraging our state legislature uh, as well as the Public Service Commission, that they should be treating carbon pipelines the same way that they do oil pipelines, uh, meaning they have to have a due process for landowners, a routing approval, et cetera. So far, the state legislature and the Public Service Commission in Nebraska is essentially saying this is not our problem. Um, so that's another big reason why it's important that landowners join the Nebraska Eastman Action Team, because right now our state senators and the Public Service Commission is not protecting people's property rights and is not uh, looking at the risks of these pipelines, the routes, how far they can be from homes. Um, so in the meetings that we're going to hold next week, that's a question that Rob asked, uh, what are we going to be discussing? So in those meetings, it's going to be myself and Tom Ganung, our landowner organizer, and we're going to be doing kind of more in depth on what can you be asking your county commissions to do if our state legislature and um, the Public Service Commission aren't going to step in to protect people's property rights? Uh, we have some sample ordinances uh, that Iowa counties and Holt County, for example, in Nebraska have created that you can ask your county commission to do. Counties have the ability to set zoning, to set a temporary moratorium, for example, on copper carbon pipelines until more information is gathered. So we're gonna talk about that as well as answer just more questions that we know people like to do one-on-one -on -one in person. So those will be smaller kind of coffees that we have um, in Wayne, in Norfolk, in Grand Island and in Columbus. I think I have that right, yes. Uh, so those are the four towns that will be in next week both on March 3rd and March 4th. Seeing if there's anything else. Uh, the question, Brian, is can, and, um, do landowners have to allow the land surveyors on their land because there's confusion about what the law is in Iowa versus what the law is in Nebraska? Yeah, and great question. And, and it is confusing, but we just have to remember each state can make whatever wacky laws they want or choose not to do anything at all. And so there isn't a lot of crossover, right? Because each state can do their own thing. And so in, in Nebraska, it's very nuanced, um, but the survey might be the vehicle for the fight right out of the gate. And what I mean by that is it is lawful in Nebraska uh, for a pipeline company or their agents to enter on to private lands, but there has to be certain conditions. And all of these following conditions have to be true. Either the pipeline company itself or the entity surveying has to be associated with a pipeline company that has eminent domain rights. And so right out of the gate, we're gonna encourage you to put up no trespassing signs, just like we did a decade ago, right all across Nebraska. We're gonna encourage you that if, if someone's coming out there or sending letters or acting like they can do it, that you are telling them they can't do it, asking them for what authority that is. Do you have a copy of it? Uh, reporting any type of trespass to your local law enforcement, documenting it with your smartphones or cameras and, and really kind of setting up roadblocks right out of the gate. Because if they don't have eminent domain, they can't just come on and, and survey. And so really the pinch point of is eminent domain in play here may come out right away in some specific landowner survey fight. So let's assume they did have eminent domain, which we do not. Um, they would also first have to negotiate with you about the easement, about, about your property and about accessing it. Uh, they'd have to identify themselves exactly who they are, their name, who they work for, to a landowner or a person lawfully in possession, not just some person standing on the corner. 
Um, and then they have to inform you exactly what they are intending to do. And if they cause any damage on your property at all, if they knock over one corn stock or break a lock or scratch a building or a vehicle, they are responsible for those damages. That's why it is important to basically shadow them if they are coming onto your property, if you can't or have someone you trust do that. So it's far from clear uh, if they have it because the first trigger is eminent domain rights. So that's the big hurdle. We say no, they don't have those rights so they can't survey. Um, and so Nebraska, again, is more murky, which is good and bad, right? There's not a clear path, but there's also availability to have some challenges and create hopefully new and better law around that dubious issue. And we strongly encourage, we'll bring yard signs with us to the meetings that we're gonna hold next week. We strongly encourage uh, landowners to put those yard signs up or to put up your own no trespassing sign. Uh, so it's very clear to the land surveyors that they're not allowed on your property. Uh, there's no legal requirement to let them onto your property, as Brian said. Uh, oh, go ahead, Mark. I was just say there's one quick follow-up from uh, Shelly, um, and she submitted some email and I forgot to reply to her. But um, what about drones? Um, we're seeing that these companies are able to use drones for surveying purposes. You can take really high quality photographs and get a lot of data uh, and not have to even step foot on someone's property. So Brian, can you speak to that? You know, that's a fascinating one. So like we talked before, when I ran through that list of rights, you have air rights. I mean, think about it. When you step out of your front door and step on to say your driveway, say, you know, I'm six foot three. So obviously I have the right to occupy six foot three of space in the air above the ground. And so the question is, where do our air rights stop and start and where is it kind of free game? And again, that is unclear, um, especially in regards to the intent of spying on your property. And it can be a trespass. You can, you can commit a trespass without a physical invasion. Um, and so I would again argue that that is not allowed, that it's a, it's a trespass, that they're causing you, you know, distress and a person shouldn't have to deal with a, a drone taking videos of who knows what, looking in your house, who knows what it's doing. Um, and so that'll probably be another fight. But I take the position and I encourage you to that that's not allowed. I just make them say why it is and show you the law that gives them that right. Exactly. Uh, another question is, say nine out of 10 farms along the planned pipeline route oppose, but one in that area wants it. Do all 10 have to oppose or will the desire of the one farm who wants it open the gate to force everybody else? No, so great question. Um, literally, if there were 10,000 pieces of property and 10,000 different owners, if one person fought it, there potentially would be a chance to stop it if you got the right court ruling eventually. Now, the reverse is much better, right? Power in numbers, that's the whole idea of need. But no, one person somewhere in your county can't force it. It's not an all or nothing proposition. If they get 50% of the people to blindly agree to these very terrible deals and 50% fight it, or even 10% fight it, you still have a real chance. And the Trans-Canada uh, fight, when we first got involved, Trans-Canada was so far down the path that literally there was only 10% of landowners holding out. And we were able to leverage that 10% into route changes, which allowed us to get more people under our neat tent. And that allowed us to crack the door open to have the success we did. So more is always better. But even if you're the only person in your county that doesn't want it, you still have a chance because you can join up with everybody else. Thanks, Brian. I think those are the only questions right now. Um, the last thing that I just wanted to say, and then I'll throw to Paul and Brian for any closing remarks is we did uh, get a bill introduced, folks who are concerned about pipelines in the state legislature this year, uh, Senator Bostar out of Lincoln did introduce a bill to add on to what we were able to pass when Keystone XL was coming through, 
about when a pipeline is abandoned, essentially meaning the company no longer wants to use it. Uh, the basic uh, proposal in that law that Senator Bostar introduced was that the land easement should revert, revert back to the land owner because right now in our state, a pipeline company can seek a permanent easement. And that's exactly what these carbon pipelines are asking for. So they would uh, own that easement forever and could transfer it to whatever other pipeline company that they wanted. So we were asking basic things like when a pipeline is no longer in use 50 years down the road or 30 years down the road when it's no longer in use, very similar to what a windmill company has to do, that easement returns back to the landowner. The legislature is not even willing to do that. <laughs> so it shows you that we need more elected officials that are really are having the backs of farmers, ranchers, landowners, and tribal nations who want to protect their land and want to have the ability to make sure that they're growing the land and passing it on to future generations. So I did want to flag that. The bill's not completely dead yet, but we did not get a warm reception in the committee, which just shows that we got to keep on working, keep on organizing. So Brian, I'll throw it to you to see if you have anything uh, in closing and then Paul. Yep, so again, this is a tried and true method, not something we invented yesterday, um, been around for approximately a decade. We'll deal with the communications, we'll keep everything organized, keep you updated on the legal uh, information from my side, from our great organizers with the NEAT group. Uh, we'll keep you updated via emails and action items and latest tips. And when necessary, we'll take the legal action to defend you. Because if you don't do it and defend yourself by joining up with others that are like-minded, no one else is going to do it for you. And there's just going to be another one and another one and another one. And so we've got to, at the very least, chip away. And when you're busy chipping away at these, at these uh, eminent domain abuse and these unnecessary projects, that chipping away can often lead to big victories. So I encourage you to go to nebraskaeasement.org. Uh, you can email us there. You can join up, sign on, and encourage you to share that website with as many people as you know. Uh, the more, the better. And we look forward to working with you and meeting you in person sometime soon. Great. Thank you, Brian. And Paul, any last words? Let's say that you know, these are new pipelines at, at a new scale. And even though we all like to think that there's not gonna be ruptures and the companies like to say that they've got it all handled, we also all know that pipelines in fact do rupture. And we do need to have additional information to keep everybody safe in case they do get built. And we're looking forward to helping with that. If you have any questions, just certainly email Jane or Bold Nebraska and, and Bold of Bold Alliance and we will get back to you with answers to your questions. And thank you for being here. Thanks, Paul. And thank you to everyone who joined with us tonight. Uh, hopefully I'll see you next week in person. We'll have coffee, cookies, pie, <laughs> all sorts of good stuff wherever we're going. Lots of handouts and lots of time for questions and answers. See everybody. <laughs>